Good evening and welcome to this very special event on behalf of the Geelong Regional Library Corporation. Um, we know many of you are feeling the impact of the pandemic in the Geelong area and we hope that tonight at least you can relax and enjoy being at home with one of Australia's most acclaimed writers and judging by the number of people who signed on for this event I would have to say that Kate Grenville is also one of the most popular and beloved writers in Australia. But before we get to Kate, um, Geelong Regional Library Corporation acknowledges Wadawurrung and Eastern Ma original owners of the land on which the library services operate. We pay respect to Wadawurrung and Eastern Ma elders past, present and emerging. We acknowledge and celebrate First Nations peoples of this land as the custodians of learning, literacy, knowledge and story. Now, you can participate in this event, in fact, we hope you will, by clicking on the Q&A button, which is at the bottom of your screen, to type a question or a comment. You may, if you're using an iPad or an iPhone tonight, need to touch your screen first to get the Q&A function. This event is also being recorded, so you can watch it again or recommend it and share it with friends and family, and it will be uploaded to the library's YouTube channel probably by the end of this week. And at the end of this session, you'll see a link which will come up and show you how to order Kate's book online. Few books, I think, have been as eagerly anticipated as this new novel from Kate Grenville, A Room Made of Leaves, to which she brings her signature ability to tell a compelling story based on, but not bound to or by, historical events. I just love seeing where Kate's curiosity takes her and us. I feel like she's got the inquiring mind of both a scientist and a detective. In a room made of leaves, we get inside the mind of Elizabeth MacArthur, who was the subject of a recent biography by uh, Michelle Scott Tucker. Raised in Devon, she married Captain John MacArthur in 1788 and just over a year later sailed to the colony where life was, to put it mildly, harsh. But she became a very successful businesswoman as well as being a loyal, sort of, wife <laughs> and mother to nine children. In this fictional version of Elizabeth, Kate Grenville presents us with a woman of multiple ambiguities, but who also possesses some of the traits that we associate with the women we love from the pages of her almost contemporary Jane Austen. This is one of the most layered, subtle, and yet bold novels I can remember. And in the age of fake news, on top of everything else, it urges the reader not to believe too quickly. From another angle of relevance, it brings the past smack up into the present in the way it challenges us to face up to our ongoing relationship with First Nations people. And there are other very contemporary resonances I can hardly wait to raise. Welcome, Kate Grenville. Thank you. It's lovely to be with you all. Can I ask you, first of all, what country are you on? Thank you. I'm on the Wurundjeri Willem country of the Kulin Nation, and I would like to pay my respects to their elders. Stories have been told for millennia on this particular piece of land, I'm sure. So I pay my respects to all of those who have been doing that for so long. And I'm speaking to you interstate from Darawal country, which is the country of the Wadi Wadi people on the south coast of New South Wales. And I pay my respects to their elders and storytellers past present and emerging. Okay, let's dive in because there's just so much to talk about with this book. Um, Kate, you thought of this book 20 years ago, and I'm just wondering um, how you keep a book on the back burner and know when both it and you are ready, because I often um, think of books that sort of arrive in your mind at a certain point a bit like planes and you have to keep them in a holding pattern flying around until you can give them permission to land. Yes look it's partly that it's partly because this book was actually very difficult and although 20 years ago when I was researching the Secret River I came across the idea that has since become this book. I had no idea how to go about writing it so it wasn't so much a holding pattern as 
sending the plane off in many different directions until finally it came back with the message, yes, I am now ready to land, thank you very much. And of course, I did also read, write um, either five or six books in that same 20 year period, which were kind of more urgent. They were just about to land. I had to get them written. Um, yeah, a, a book is a strange thing. I mean, you have a certain amount of control over it and in another way, you kind of don't. I almost feel as if I'm always chasing the book. I'm always a bit behind it. It's showing itself to me and I'm a bit obtuse for a very long time. It's why I have to write so many drafts. I was actually up to, up to draft 34 when I gave, when I know it's, look, it's a mark of my stupidity that it takes me that many times. <laughs> I think it's a mark of your persistence. And by the way, I should also just mention to the audience, we did not collude about what we were going to wear this evening. The purple <laughs> is completely by coincidence. Okay, glad we've got that out of the way. Um, just um, wanted to ask you, just staying with that a little bit, is there a sense, Kate, in which you have to give yourself permission to take a real um, existing person's life on in this way? Is there, is there a sense in which you have a kind of sense of the boundaries that are set up and established by a biography like Michelle Scott Tucker's, which you acknowledge in, in um, your book, in the acknowledgements. I mean, what are the parameters here? Look, um, I suppose every, every writer has their own version of what their parameters are. Um, uh, look, mine were quite simple. Not all that much is known about Elizabeth MacArthur. And in a way, that's a great advantage for a novelist. It mm. gives me a lot of latitude. But I did decide that if I were to depart from the little that is known, you know, historical facts, if I was going to depart from that, if I were going to depart from that, I would kind of acknowledge it um, and only do it if I kind of absolutely had to. So, in fact, there are very few times when I've departed from the kind of historical record, I think. Um, but I'm not a historian and this is not history. So that was not, it was not about out of any sense of purity that I did that. It was more that if you enter a moment in the past in its reality, and so far as the historical record can tell you, it will always throw up the things that a novelist needs, which is things that do not make sense, contradictions, ambiguities, questions that won't go away and which can never be answered because the historical record is partial. It privileges the white male version of events, all those reasons. So I set, that, I set up that little parameter for myself and it gave me great satisfaction. So there are, I think, two ways in which I very knowingly departed from the historical record. But that's just my own you know, you do need, it's like writing a sonnet. It's a great help that it's only going to be 14 lines and it's going to have the, whatever it is happens at line 12. Um, that's a great help for the creative imagination, which otherwise can just sort of squander itself going in every direction. It's lovely to have a restriction. So I'm curious whether you think that Hilary Mantel has been a significant influence in, in um, thinking about historical fiction where you get inside the mind of a, of a significant... Uh, character, single individual. Um, obviously, you know, she's she's done it at a sort of very virtuosic level in terms of the kind of sustained um, effort of three volumes over a, a very, very rich period of time, a very complex and rich period of time. Do you think that there is a sort of mantel factor at play here for either writers or readers in accepting this idea? Oh, look, I don't know. I mean, people have been doing this, well, since Homer. I mean, there was a real man who was kind of like Ulysses. Shakespeare springs to mind. This is a very, very old form of writing that we're all doing. And um, good on Hilary Mantel for bringing that bit of history so colourfully uh, to life. Um, and in a way, yeah, look, I think it's been very good. But I think... You know, the, the Academy sometimes has a problem, uh, as we know, with historical fiction. I don't think readers do. I don't think readers have any problem about knowing that, OK, this is fiction. We take it with a huge pinch of salt. We do not believe too quickly, but we're going to enjoy it. And frankly, we may not enjoy the history. 
quite mm. so much. Mm. So, uh, yeah, good on her for kind of making making historical fiction sexy. Well, and you've made colonial history sexy, frankly. Well, well, that is a challenge. That is a challenge because Australian history, you know, people groan, oh, no, Australian history, it's so boring, nothing happened. So the great challenge there, whereas we all know Cromwell and all that lot were interesting. Mm -hmm. We were taught, us Australians, that Australian history was boring. So it is a fantastic pleasure for me to go into some tiny little corner of it, such as the myths about the MacArthur's, um, and to explode them into a much more interesting shape and to say, look, our history is just as interesting as everybody else's. Absolutely. If, if I had been taught this history your way, my God, you know, I would absolutely have been, have been riveted. I agree. Um, before we go to the sort of sexy bits, I hope we'll get to the sexy bits. Um, I just wanted to ask you about the references that I made in the introduction to Jane Austen, because you also signpost Jane Austen up front. Um, and there are various kind of things that you do in this book where you see um, the business of um, being married off, the social gatherings, which are opportunities for people to meet the right match in, you know, uh, the opposite sex. So you are very deliberately, aren't you, paying a sort of homage to Jane Austen? Yes, I am, because uh, this book is... You know, the women of those times had only one weapon at their disposal. They could not write down anything of what they must have really thought about their hideous lives of almost no choice and no power. They couldn't write it down in letters because letters were public documents. Yes. They couldn't write it down in novels unless at least the surface of the novel was kind of respectable and conventional, what a lady should do. The only weapon they had was irony. And that, of course, is what Jane Austen does magnificently. So uh, she presents what ca can appear to be a blameless, ladylike surface. But under that, of course, is rage. I mean, if you read Jane Austen through a certain lens, this is a very, very angry voice that you hear. And no wonder they had a rotten life. And so I brought that parallel in because my book is also extremely ironic and it's based on the irony that Elizabeth MacArthur left really her only, the only record of what she was like are her letters. And her letters are very bland, very proper, rather pious, the devoted wife. They are the expected and conventional thing of a woman of her time. But of course her life was anything but demure, respectable, or as cheerful as her letters make out her life to be. So in that gap between the letters, which put this kind of Pollyanna view forward, and what we know of her real life with a man, her husband, extremely difficult, one of the most difficult husbands on the planet, I would go so far as to say, and a woman like a Jane Austen, from the same background as Jane Austen, plunged into, you know, the hideousness of um, Sydney in 1790, a, con a, a brutal penal colony, uh, the disparity between the letters on the one hand, the life on the other, is the place where a novelist, as I did 20 years ago, thinks, ah, there's a story here. Mm -hmm. And the story is in that gap where there's an ironic distance between what's presented and what's real. But you know, Kate, there's something quite tragic and poignant about what you say, which is, you know, this is something that we think of as being in the past, these very performative letters, which are going to be read back home to everybody at the vicarage, everybody, ever, everybody who ever knew Elizabeth wants to know about her life in the new world. But then I thought about Sylvia Plath's letters home, her letters to her mother, which were equally in the 50s, um, full of lies and illusions about life is absolutely splendid. And, you know, I mean, women have not stopped doing this. Even in the 20th century, they felt that they had to perform a certain kind of success. Isn't that tragic to think of that span of history? Absolutely. And all those people who primp themselves up to put themselves on social media, it's exactly the same. I suppose the difference is we do have a choice. We, we do that. I mean, after all, Sylvia Plath could write the poems which are a savage, frank outpouring of what she really thought. So we at least do have a, a choice of how much we want to show and um, what kind of person we want to present. Whereas a woman like Elizabeth MacArthur had no choice, which is why 
you know, one of the reasons it took me 20 years to write was how am I going to tell this story, which is kind of getting in behind that myth of the perfect wife that we've all learned about, about Elizabeth MacArthur. That is anybody who's heard of her, not, you know, not everybody has. How can I do that? And it was not until I came up with the idea that, ah, she's written her secret memoirs, her inflammatory, scandalous, frank, outpouring of the heart, secret memoirs, hidden them away, 250 years later, they appear, and by some incredible miracle, they <laughs> arrive in my hands. <laughs> not a historian, not an archaeologist, but the hands of a novelist. How fabulous. So all I've done, of course, is transcribe, edit and transcribe these memoirs, which are, you know, fresh from her heart. So when I thought of that kind of framing device, it made it all possible. I could then enter her voice and, oh, I had such good fun doing it. Well, you, you clearly did. And you take the whole idea of an unreliable narrator to, to, to a new level. Before we um, get back to Elizabeth, though, there's something that you said there about, you know, possibly the worst husband on the planet, which I just have to go to this. I cannot resist it. Um, you mean there's a worse one? <laughs> well, yes, I'm just coming to that. That's the point. So Elizabeth's descriptions of her husband, he's vain. He makes all sorts of social faux pas. He has an explosive temper. Um, he starts feuds with people. He makes bad business decisions. This is Trump. Well, actually, some of those things that you mentioned are not actually true of John MacArthur. They're certainly true of Trump. Um, but were you thinking about Trump? I mean, you say, you know, there's one quote that I just want to read. My husband was rash, impulsive, changeable, self-deceiving, cold, unreachable, self-regarding, someone whose judgment was dangerously unbalanced. I mean, come on. You know, a lot of writers um, are very careful, and I'm one of them, about writing about things that you wouldn't want to happen in case they come true, because most of us have had that experience. You write something and then, oh my God, there it is happening. So, but I'm not going to take responsibility for the man in the White House. I did start writing this book, you know, some years before he was on the agenda, but it is kind of uncanny. And it is, I mean, I always said, Look, I'm interested in history. I'm interested in the past. I'm interested in Elizabeth MacArthur. But what I'm really interested in is the present. Mm. And this is essentially a book about the present. And as you say, fake news, misinformation, all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, all of, all, of that, all of that stuff about the past is really just a mechanism to talk about today. But to have written the book and then see how uncanny that resemblance is, um, was a little, little more in the present than I really, mm, I feel a bit enough more than I can chew. Yeah, did I invent that man? Surely not. It's really, it's spooky. I mean, you know, I was chuckling to myself all the way through <laughs> going, I can't believe it. Anyway, um, back to Elizabeth. Um, there's something interesting about her, which is true in real life. I mean, you didn't make this up, but it does remind me of something else. So you, you um, let us know early on that Elizabeth was plain. And in um, Elizabeth Gilbert's book, The Signature of All Things, she creates a fictional 18th century heroine who is plain. And this gives her a tremendous advantage because it allows her intelligence to come to the fore. Her beauty is not a distraction. And I was wondering whether you saw Elizabeth's plainness as being something that in a sense uh, was an asset because of a similar thing, that it, it meant that she had to invest in her curiosity. She had to learn things. She had to work with what she had. Yes, look, I think in the, in the 18th century, probably physical beauty was not, a, it was not as big a factor as it is for us today, because marriage, the whole courtship thing, didn't really have much to do, I don't think, with physical attraction. Mm. Um, it had to do with money. I mean, the only way, the only career option for a woman was to get married. There, wa there was no other career. And the only, the only choice you had, and it wasn't, it was a very limited choice, was which of the men that you happened to meet uh, might not only, well, might, might give you a, a decent life. I mean, we know from Jane Austen that a man like John MacArthur, uh, with his lack of prospects, would probably in fact not have married. In fact, he wasn't Captain John MacArthur when, when they married. He was Ensign 
John MacArthur. Mm -hmm. Big difference. Yeah. Very lowest form of officer. Um, so, you know, it's, it's um, that whole notion that love was involved. Jane Austen is not about love. No. She's about commerce. Those books are, they, those books are, are they're business manuals, really. That's, they're about transactions. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. So I think our obsession with looks, um, the reason I made her plain in the book, though, is that when you look at the, the only portrait which is likely to be of her, in fact, it is, in fact, there are two pictures of her, and she's not ugly, but she's not beautiful. The one that's sometimes put forward as the picture of her, which is lovely curls and beautiful little face. She's like a little chocolate box person. She's probably actually nobody, but she's pretty sure not. That one is called, you know, it's, it's, said to be, it's uh, reputed to be of Elizabeth MacArthur, but the, the one that hangs in Elizabeth Farm is a woman with a str was a strong, interesting, but not particularly beautiful face. And the photograph of her as an older woman which I've looked at many times. I think what a shrewd, ironic glance you have. Mm. So. Um, I'm just going to remind the audience that you can actually pop a question into the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of your screen at any point. We can take questions as you ask them or we can save them all up for the end, but feel free to um, throw one in at any point. Um, Kate, you've obviously done a lot of research for the book and the book wears the research so lightly. You know, that's, that's one of the beautiful achievements of it. One of the things that you've clearly learned a lot about is the breeding of sheep. <laughs> but I was wondering whether there was anything really arcane or obscure that you discovered for this book, apart from learning about um, sheep husbandry, um, that really kind of surprised you. I mean, for example, one of the things that I love as a detail in the book is this idea that apparently when you went to dinner at the governor's house, because food was so scarce, um, you brought your own bread. Is that true? Oh, absolutely. In fact, that quote, if, that line where the governor says, there will always be a role at my table for Mrs. MacArthur, is straight out of uh, maybe the what contention, one of the early accounts. It is a verbatim, you know, that's straight out of the, I, I filched a many, many lines out of the historical record. That was certainly one of them. Look, as for the most interesting thing, gosh, you know, I come back to the idea of William Dawes, who of course has fascinated me and many other people for many years. I've written about him in The Lieutenant and clearly I didn't get it out of my system there. But the fact that a young man who was an army officer and completely saturated in the, the psychology of the colonial project could sit down and um, learn the Gadigal lang language with such respect and through the notebooks that he wrote the language in, shines an astonishingly, you know, given who, who he was, an astonishingly respectful, playful, um, admiring uh, attitude to the people whose land he was on. Mm. Uh, that's not a new idea, but it continues to amaze me. Here is a man who could step out of his world somehow unaided, could step out of his world and expand his mind to something else. And of course, when I wrote The Lieutenant, I actually had Elizabeth MacArthur in there. Um, she was rather keen on him. She flirted with him, in fact, and she would have quite liked, you know, to go a little bit further. But in the version that I wrote in The Lieutenant, uh, he was already suited. He actually had a convict mistress, which all of the officers did. Now, in a late draft of that book, for reasons which are now obscure to me, I took both the convict mistress and Mrs. MacArthur out of the lieutenant, and I always mourned them. So I put them away. I have a big folder called Good Bits to Use Later. <laughs> <laughs> what an imaginative title that is. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Very thrifty. Um, and so it was with a huge pleasure that I could realise that not only could I put Mrs. MacArthur and William Dawes back together again, but I could also even put in the convict mistress, who of course is Mrs. Brown in, in this book. 
who is, I mean, she has a whole story of herself. Somebody else might have to write her story, but there's a whole novel there as well. So I yes, love, I love that idea that characters tell you, um, we're not done with you. <laughs> you, need, you need to give us another go. You know, that's really what that sort of feels like in a way to me. That's right. I mean, any given novel has its own logic, which is why I took them out of, um, out of The Lieutenant, because I wanted that book to be very focused about this is a man and his relationship with the Gadigal people and the moral dilemma it gets him into. Um, and I thought if I complicate it with all these love affairs, it's going to kind of diffuse what I thought was a very important thing to be talking about. Um, but yes, some characters do come to you with the force of real people. Mm. And uh, of course that's not true, but it certainly feels true. <laughs> mm. Now I said before um, that we would get to the sexy bits and, and this is sort of a preamble in a way to the sexy bit. Before Elizabeth um, marries, she has been thinking a great deal about the value of her virginity as an asset. We were talking about the transactional relationships in Jane Austen, but um, she has also, it's fair to say, dabbled a little bit sexually <laughs> with her friend, Bridie. And um, she describes what's so wonderful about the way you, um, you describe these encounters. You say that they are natural and without shame. And I'm curious about what made you confident to assert that for women of that era. Well, well, you're talking about what went on in the, in the bed that was shared by Elizabeth and her close friend, Bridie, hmm. who was the daughter of the local clergyman, and Elizabeth lived in that household for some, some years. Elizabeth was, of course, the daughter of a farmer. A lot of people think she was an aristocrat. I say to people, I'm writing about Elizabeth MacArthur, and they say, oh, Lady MacArthur. No, 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 she was a farmer's daughter. And John MacArthur, who tried to make out that he was also aristocracy, was actually the son of a draper. So, you know, these were people from very modest beginnings, which is why they went to New South Wales, to make some money. Anyway, I'm, I'm skirting around what you want to ask me about. <laughs> um, so Bridie and, and Elizabeth are... In a, in a bed together, there weren't many beds in those days, so you often had to share a bed with somebody else. And look, you know, it's winter, you're with a person who's a very good friend, you're about 12 probably, um, maybe a little older. Um, it doesn't seem to me very, uh, very extreme. I mean, Jane Austen couldn't talk about it, but I think no. I can. It does, it does seem to me a very understandable and natural thing. Kids experiment, all that stuff. It's, it's not a big deal, I don't think, as it wasn't for them. Now, I think behind your question is also the question about imposing a 21st sensibility on an 18th century woman. <laughs> and there, I think I would say, look, we don't know what they were like because they could not tell us. I mean, what I've tried to do in this book is to say, imagine if one of them could actually tell us what she thought about being powerless, being forced to marry, you know, saddled with this dreadful husband, no divorce. Um, so she's finally telling us about it. Mm. Um, so I think when we say, oh, we're imposing a 21st, sensi 21st century sensibility, uh, that's making a leap. It's, 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 it's assuming that those people were so different from us that they didn't feel the same sense of outrage and grief, for example, the women, at the lives they were condemned to. Why should we think they didn't feel angry? But not only um, do they not uh, tell, uh, tell us, you know, they can't tell us how they felt about any of these things, but one of the things that I think you also convey very effectively is that they didn't tell each other. So that you went into sex and you went into childbirth mm. with virtually nothing said to you or something said to you that was so oblique and bland and unspecific that you had no idea what it meant. So, and again, you know, sort of drawing the parallel with making the leap forward to um, 
Sylvia Plath. I've just um, been speaking recently with Deborah Feldman about her book Unorthodox, about what it's like to live in an Orthodox Jewish community in the heart of New York. And I mean, it's inconceivable to us that you could be sexually ignorant to that point in the 21st century, and yet, apparently, it happens. But I think that that's one of the things that the book really, um, there's something very tragic about the fact that Elizabeth stumbles into sex and childbirth with so little idea of what awaits her. Yes, I think if you were lucky to have a reasonable sort of mother or an aunt or something, you would be told something. But, you know, I think I say at one point that Mrs. Kingdon, who's Bridie's mother, Elizabeth's sort of adoptive mother in a way, um, it, it, it wasn't that she was embarrassed to tell the facts of life. She didn't have the vocabulary. I think it's sometimes that simple. So that's why it's all dressed up in, in, in sort of um, imagery and, and metaphors. Because, I mean, even when I was growing up, one of the great things about that wave of feminism that took over in the early 70s was that it gave us words to actually name things, not just parts of the body, although that was a huge relief too, but ways that we were feeling. The personal is political. I mean, that's such a terrible cliche now, but at the time it was a, an earthquake, a, a fabulous earthquake. So I think... You know, one of the many things women were deprived was a language to talk to each other frankly about those important things. It is heartbreaking to think how many women must have gone into childbirth having not the faintest, not the faintest idea. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. We've got a question from the audience, which um, I think is a very timely one. What is, uh, this is from Lisa Tabone, and she wants to know what is the significance of the title, which is a beautiful uh, title. Right. Well, I don't want to spoil the story, but there are two rooms made of leaves in this book, and both of them are beautiful clearings in the Australian bush looking out onto water. Um, the first one is where she and William Dawes um, enjoy some time together, let's say, to use a sort of 18th century uh, oblique way of saying that they, well, they had a good time together. More than that, though, because Dawes had this understanding about the place and the people and a curiosity, he is the one that introduced this uh, woman from a little village in Devon to the fact that there was another world and it had other people in it who lived very different lives which were unrecognisable and yet one, one could enjoy respecting them and enjoying them, that, you know, the Gadigal people. So um, the, room made, the first room made of leaves was her education. The second one is at the end of her life when she's in another room made of leaves beside um, the Parramatta River. And she realises that this room made of leaves is representative of the fact that she loves Australia. She's an immigrant who has come to realise that this is the place where she, when she dies, she wants to become the dust of this place. Even though, at the same time, she says, I know that it is not my place. And she says, you know, I have to acknowledge that I'm a thief. I love this room made of leaves, but I have to acknowledge that I've stolen it. What you do with that, I don't know, and she didn't know. But at least to acknowledge it is one, one thing you can do. So, the room made of leaves, I hope, shimmers with both these possibilities. Well, and it also shimmers for me, at least, with another kind of, again, modern reference. So I don't know whether everybody does this, Kate, but the moment you as a woman see a book with a cover where the first two words are a room, you know, you complete the sentence and you think a room of one's own. And so I immediately thought Elizabeth finds in at least the first room with, with doors, she finds freedom, she finds pleasure, she finds desire, she finds self-expression. And to me, those are all the things Things that Virginia Woolf wants to celebrate in her room of her own. Were you thinking of that? Oh, absolutely. Because uh, as you would know, the room made of leaves is described by Mr. Dawes as uh, uh, mon petit coin à moi, my little, my little corner, all of my own. So that's exactly because as an outsider within the military establishment, he also needed a room of his own. Yes. So all that was all that shimmers. So thank you for 
kind of. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's my pleasure. Um, now, you mentioned the Gadigal people and the sensitivity and the respect with which Dawes engages with them. And um, I think what's so interesting about Elizabeth's response to that is that she's curious, but that she also admits to her own inability to go beyond her own sort of um, conventional reserve. She, she would like to be able to say more than hello, but she recognizes that her skirts are awkward for sitting on the ground with these women and that she's never really going to be able to break through. And I wondered again, you know, in terms of modern resonances, is that you and is that us? Yes, interesting. Look, her skirts certainly don't stop her sitting on the ground. The thing that makes sitting on the ground with the Gadigal and Wongal women possible is her relationship with Mr Dawes, because he's the translator for a start. He is the bridge, because mm. he's made a bridge and, and the Gadigal people have made a bridge with him. And yes, I think that is absolutely the dilemma that we have today. Um, it's uh, what, what we as, as white Australians have to learn, I think, is to listen. And I think we find that very difficult. We find it quite easy to, um, you know, say things. And we find it not all that difficult to ask questions. But both of those things are not what's required in certain circumstances. To listen and to open the mind is what's needed. And... As you say, Elizabeth MacArthur, everybody needs help to do that. That's a difficult thing to do, actually, to mm. step outside your own culture to the extent that you can actually uh, not even hope to understand another culture, but to kind of recognise its difference and to respect it. So she does recognise her limitations there, as it is ours. I mean, this is very much... When she says at the end of the book, you know, I am a thief on this land, that is the situation that, uh, as a descendant of, you know, convict uh, British people, uh, I very much feel that's, that's the dilemma. Well, you know, there's such extraordinary prescience in this book. And, you know, particularly here we are in the um, controversial anniversary uh, cook year and, of course, in the whole Black Lives moment. Uh, and, of course, we're referencing debates about monuments. And uh, you write up front as the pseudo editor transcriber of Elizabeth's Secret Papers that John MacArthur is celebrated in um, streets and swimming pools and parks that are named after him. And after reading in your book, I thought to myself, why don't we have a statue of Pemelroy in Parramatta? <laughs> yes, look, uh, th that would be one way to do it. We've got the statues of the dead white males who we no longer admire. So, you know, counter it with the statues of the other people. But actually, uh, my feeling about the statues is that it, it kind of misses the point. It's not about the individuals. It's about the system. The personal is political, if you like. So, yes, I believe it. we should topple those statues, get them off their pedestals. I think I've said somewhere else we should put them all in a big barn with a big sign around their necks saying, we used to admire this, you know, this is how wrong we've been in the past. Um, everybody should have a statue in a way. And on, on the other hand, maybe nobody should because the statue says we are we are valuing the, we're kind of, um, we're kind of assuming that the world is made by individuals and actually it's the systems that we need to fight, not the individuals. Uh, mindsets, philosophies, uh, that's, and that's the great danger, I think, of putting anybody on a pedestal, no matter how admirable they are. It's kind of missing what we really need to do, which is to change the system. Oh, I love that radical spirit. I love that. I love oh, I that. Really <laughs> My father was a Trotskyite after all for about excellent, five minutes. Excellent. Um, we've got another question from Margaret McNamara, which is lovely because it references the sort of echoing and persistence of characters that insist on coming back. Um, uh, she says, my friend and I have both read your beautifully written, very interesting book. She said to me that she would love you to now write Mrs. Brown and Hannaford's story. And I totally agree. Would you consider? <laughs> Look, 
Um, I have considered it because I think it would be a fabulous story. Um, <laughs> but I'm what I need. I'm one of those writers. I'm like yogurt. I need something to start on. I need a starter culture. <laughs> And so with every book that I've written, I think I've had some kind of document or text to start with. And with Elizabeth MacArthur, of course, it was her real letters, which are threaded through this piece of fiction. Uh, so if somebody could come up with uh, some kind of body of something that I could work on, documents would be ideal about a Mrs. Brown and a Hannaford, please send them to me and I'll have a <laughs> <laughs> well, since we're talking about um, papers, letters, documents, the, the form that the book takes, you've written the book as papers that are transcribed and, and in so doing, you, you've made a narrative that is quite fragmented and episodic. Um, you've written short scenes and short sections. Was that liberating for you to do that and for you to not have to write write longer chapters, um, but to write moments that were almost um, filmic, some of them just a page long. Yes. Yes, it was incredibly liberating. And I remember when I started writing it, I thought, um, having written several novels since, which were very conventional realist novels, I thought, let's go back to where I began with Lillian's story, which I wrote back in 1980 or some you know, dim distant past, which was a little series of fragments I trained as a, as a filmmaker, I was a film editor of documentaries for some time. And so I, I feel that I see the world in terms of scenes. So it's not so much that you make a seamless narrative as you make a series of juxtapositions, which kind of, you hope, resonate with each other. And it was a huge freedom. You know, the, the most boring thing about writing a novel is kind of getting people from A to B. They're in a room and they somehow have to be got down into the street. So they've got to go through a door and down some stairs and along a corridor. How much of that do you put in? Do you have to put any of it in? And if you don't put it in, how do you make that little jump cut? You know? So yes, I loved, and it's fun thinking up the little headings for each one. Yeah, I had so much fun with this book. I can imagine. Oh, I'm glad. I, I hate the idea of toil. You know, I think we have to move what? away from the idea of toil, don't you? This is play. Um, this is play. Got, uh, two questions now. Barbara Katic, what was the most surprising fact that you discovered about um, Elizabeth in the course of your research? Ah, what a good question. Um, I was surprised that she came from such humble beginnings. That was a surprise to me because like many people I had assumed, because John MacArthur, the greatest self-advertiser the world has known, apart from perhaps the man in the White House, um, uh, he somehow got us all fooled that both of them were aristocrats. So the fact that she was from such humble beginnings uh, was a great surprise to me. The fact that sheep are actually so interesting is the other thing. Like a lot of city people, I had this terrible stereotype about sheep being not only boring but stupid, neither of which are, is, is true. Uh, so, yeah, it was. It's interesting because obviously um, her humble beginnings uh, are an asset. I mean, given that she grew up around um, farming culture, she, you know, she can access that knowledge later on and that's what me that's what makes her such a successful businesswoman so you know there's a there's an advantage to that absolutely i mean john MacArthur got all the credit for being as i as it, as was taught in my childhood the father of the australian sheep industry wool industry uh, in fact of course he was in london for most of the years when the sheep was being bred so clearly it wasn't him and when i realized that elizabeth's father was a farmer she lived with her grandfather who was also a farmer in devon which of course is sheep country mm. it all starts to make sense she is the mother of the i mean he was on the two dollar note you know with a with a merino sheep standing behind him i must say a rather sly looking merino sheep as if he was <laughs> uh so anyway it, it all kind of made sense when you realize her background was he grew up in Plymouth, the, the, the son of a draper. So he would have known wool only as it came off the bolt, you know, ready to be cut and up into uniforms. I have to say one thing I was curious about, um, Kate, was uh, he spent an enormous amount of time away f on various um, matters. I mean, court cases, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, in the UK. Do you, do you, were you tempted at any stage to, spec to have Elizabeth speculate about his fidelity? Oh, well, I do just 
fleetingly mention it, not so much while he was away in England, because actually that happens after the book ends. But when he took up the land at, um, took, took the land from the Baramatagal people at Parramatta and installed Elizabeth there on Elizabeth Farm, he actually yes. went in spending a great deal of time in Sydney. And That's right. I have yeah. just embedded in the book the possibility, which is, I think, quite probable, that he enjoyed himself, as every other officer did, with a, a little convict lass. Well, that that would have been the culture, and that would have been, you know, sort of um, a sort of a one-night stand. Whereas I suppose mm -hmm. I'm thinking that given that he was away for years at a time, mm -hmm. you know, I mm -hmm. sort of wonder, was there another more mm -hmm. long-term relationship possibly that we don't know anything about that was in England and whether Elizabeth would have been worried that he might never come back. Oh, I don't think she would have been worried. <laughs> <laughs> I think she would have been delighted. <laughs> uh, yes, you know, in one of her letters, now talking, speaking of irony, in one of her letters, he, when he's about to come back after his first absence, which was four or five years, she writes to a friend in Sydney, um, and she says, um, you can imagine my feelings at being told that Mr. MacArthur is about to return. Yes, I think we can absolutely imagine her feelings. <laughs> but, you know, the phrasing is very careful. Um, so, yeah, I think he probably did. He was also pretty unwell. I mean, he was a man who probably was afflicted with not only physical, but I think also mental illness. Foremost. He's depressed, in fact, that as well as the sort of grandiose scheming, there's certainly one moment in the book where he sinks into what appears to be depression. Yeah. And he's almost, it seems, maybe man there's, a, there's a quality yeah. of mania. Yeah. When you read his letters, of which there are many, and they're much more revealing, actually, than Elizabeth's. Um, I mean, I'm not the first person, people who know much more about all this than I do have suggested the same thing. Um, it is the classic, you know, mania, huge, grandiose schemes, fabulous, you know, plans and self-importance, uh, succeeded by depression of such a kind that I think in one letter he says he couldn't get out of bed for like a month. Yeah. So it's it sounds like, poor man, I mean, he he would have been a terribly, terribly difficult man to live with, but I have also tried to portray him not as a kind of one-dimensional monster, but very much as a man damaged by his childhood, probably, and also, you know, labouring under this kind of mental, this mental problem. Mm. Mm. Well, again, you know, I mean, Trump, you know, kind of mentally, mentally unwell, narcissistic personality disorder, whatever, yeah. not necessarily depression, but, you know, something right. clearly not quite right. Um, we've got another question from Margot Smith. How did you find the voice for Mrs. MacArthur? And I think that's a really interesting question because you, at the beginning, in the first half of the book, she's quite stringent. She's quite tart at times. I mean, her analysis of her husband is quite vinegary in moments. And she's also quite cunning and quite manipulative of him and of the social milieu in which she finds herself. She likes herself more after she's met Dawes. And so there's a softening and a mellowing and a greater sensuality to her. So how did you find the voice and then how did you modulate it? Mm -hmm. Yes, good question to which I really don't have much of an answer, except to say that um, there's a reason why I wrote 34 drafts. And in each of those drafts, that came a little bit clearer. Actually, the voice was pretty much there from the beginning, but that thing that you've described of her shift over the course of the book, her character actually blossoming into something, that did take quite a lot of time to try to understand. At one point when she's young, uh, where she was forced to pretend all kinds of things. She says, you know, I, I had to fold myself up small and put myself away where no one could see me. And the book really reveals her gradually blossoming. And Dawes is a very big part of it. But, um, you know, a woman doesn't necessarily need a nice love affair to blossom. It probably helps. But a lot of things, a lot of things helped her blossom. And one of them was falling in love with Australia, actually, as a not Australia, but, you know, the bit of it that she, she, that she became familiar with. Um, yeah, look, it was, um, 
in some ways it was very simple. I do remember when I was sitting up in bed one morning, actually starting the book, thinking I have to just put something down on paper. It came out very easily, her voice. And I suppose it's because I had been thinking about it for, you know, 17 years. Mm. Um, so she spoke to me. I mean, there were days when I thought I was kind of channeling Elizabeth MacArthur. I know that sounds kind of silly. Um, I don't think much of writers who say that, really. And yet, <laughs> and yet it happens. You just did. I, say. <laughs> I always think, oh, come on, pull the other one. <laughs> but then it happens to you and you think, oh, okay. I love that. I love the fact that you're so rational and sensible and <laughs> this thing, this slightly woo-woo thing happens to you when you basically, that's when you're in the zone, isn't it? That's, that's flow. That is true flow. That is, that is flow. That's right. And clearly I'm channeling something from my own unconscious if we yeah. want to be kind of rational about it. Uh, but it's an ecstatic feeling when you, when you get there, you think, yes, this is something true. This is authentic. I'm not just making something up on the basis of cliches and stereotypes and other things that I've read. This is coming from some deep authenticity in myself, not necessarily Elizabeth MacArthur, but if it feels authentic, that's, well, that's, that's why you're right, I think, isn't it? To find that moment when you are t telling the truth about something. And, and I, I imagine that when you're in that zone, it must feel like flying. That's, that's the closest I, I would imagine it would be like. And I think that what happens in that modulation that we were talking about between her slightly sort of um, tart Mm -hmm. uh, comments that she makes, which are very Austenish again, and slightly waspish at times uh, in the first half of the book and the softer, more expansive view is you've given her confidence. You've given her self-confidence. I think it's the journey that many women, not just in the 18th century, have to have to travel. I suppose men do too. I don't know about their journey, but certainly for women, um, and certainly of my generation, I think it's different for young women today. They have a different kind of journey. But that journey from feeling like a bit of a second class citizen, because that's what the culture told you, um, a culture that was misogynistic in a way that we look back in amazement that we put up with it. But we did. We put The wonderful thing about the Me Too movement is that my generation put up with all that stuff. It was like something you just accepted, like bad weather, men, you know, cracking onto you. Um, and these days women don't accept it. And that is so brilliant. But I think that journey of working out where you stand about all that, coming to respect and like yourself, uh, is still one that young women, uh, well, women of all ages are still going through. Mm, That's mm. probably not going to change. There's so many kind of themes that, that bring this book into the present in, in so many different and, and layered ways. 40 years on at the end of the book, um, we've touched on this a little bit, but I just want to come back to it. Um, Elizabeth reflects on a very modern concept. Um, she talks about the replacement of true history by a false one. Um, and I think you know, we have referenced this a little bit already, but, but people are clearly still struggling with that today. You know, that is the basis of culture wars. Uh, and she also makes, I think, two very candid admissions that are again, very relatable, possibly to the way people might feel today. She says, I'm not prepared to give them back what has always been theirs. And I am prepared to look in the eye at what we have done. Um, can you just talk about... Look, I think that's where we are today. When I say we, white Australians, that's where we are. For, for a very long time, we pretended that nothing happened, nothing to see here in terms of our relationship with the Indigenous people. Nothing to see, move along. Uh, after all, when I wrote The Secret River, it was in the middle of the history wars when there was a serious, huge scholarly apparatus saying there were no massacres, nobody was killed. It was all just measles and influenza. Um, so, you know, we have now come to the stage where we're going through, we settler Australians are going through a very painful and necessary process of acknowledging what we all acknowledged at the beginning. This is land that was taken from other people, 
they have not ceded sovereignty. Uh, and yet we have nowhere to go back to. Elizabeth MacArthur actually could have gone back. It's interesting that she never went back, even for a trip. Plenty, plenty of them did go backwards and forwards. She never went back. Um, and today we're in that situation. We, I, I've got nowhere to go back to. So what do we do with that fact? We acknowledge it. And then we go back and we try to unpick the stories that our lot have told to make it okay to be here. And we have, we've spent 250 years telling each other lies basically uh, that justify our existence. Terra nullius is one of those lies. Mm. So when Elizabeth MacArthur is sitting there in her room made of leaves at the end of the book, she is all of us non-Indigenous Australians thinking, okay, I have to look at this really un indigestible fact. This is home and yet it was stolen. So what do we do? And, and she has learned a few words. I mean, as I said before, she can't, she can't say more than, you know, the sort of basics of kind of um, polite greetings. Have you done that? I mean, you know, there's been a movement for people to start to learn some of the uh, languages which have survived in order to help to preserve them. Is that something that you've taken an active interest in? I, I admire it and, and cheer it on, but I haven't, I haven't particularly had much to do with that. Um, when I was writing a lieutenant, I spoke to people who were, you know, um, helping, to, helping to put together again the Gadigal lang language, mostly from the Dawes notebooks. Uh, and that was of huge interest to me, but no, I'm no linguist and no, I haven't. I, I can probably just about remember to say, um, mm, not even sure I can. Bujuri Gumarar, uh, you know, good day <laughs> in some well, version of Gadigal. That's more than many of us can do. <laughs> um, we've we've just about come to the end of this hour, which has absolutely um, flown past. And I just wanted to ask, since we started with the plane circling, um, given that Elizabeth was there in your mind twenty years ago. Is there something else speaking to you? Is there something coming through the channel, you know, <laughs> like a seance? Is there something there hovering, ready? <laughs> well, yes, there is. Actually, there are several planes still hovering. Um, but, you know, I have found, as many writers do, that they can be frightened away, if a plane can be frightened away, by having a searchlight beamed on it prematurely. So, yes, there are. There are a few gleams in my eye, but I think I won't. I won't. No, well, I'd have to say that There's at the moment, perception. they're probably the only planes in the sky. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, we look forward to you um, landing them safely. Thank you so much for spending this hour and being so generous in expanding on the remarkable, remarkable achievements of this book um, and on um, the life of Elizabeth, of Elizabeth MacArthur. Thank you so much, Carolyn. You've been fab it's been wonderful to talk to you. And I also want to thank the Geelong Library for giving us the opportunity and setting up all this fabulous technology. Thank you, all of you. Absolutely. Um, thank you to uh, you for being a wonderful audience. Um, oh, we've got a comment. We've just got time for this comment. You should hear this, um, Kate, from Suzanne Haring, sitting here mesmerized. I could listen to you two for hours. Okay, well, let's just keep going. Thank you, Kate, for having written some of the most important stories in my learning journey since I arrived in Australia as an adult. Yes, absolutely. I, I, um, I would comment. like to echo that sentiment um, as, as someone who, um, who kind of has grown into being an Australian with, with you as a guide, with you as a navigator, actually. Um, so yes, we have come to the um, end of this event and I just want to remind you that a link is going to come up in a moment um, which will take you to the Readings Bookstore uh, website which has a number of copies um, signed by Kate. She told me that she'd signed 500 one day and 600 the other. <laughs> Uh, and they're going like hotcakes, so you, you really, you're going to have to get in quick. So it's really a strictly while stocks last, I've never said that before, um, kind of a deal. Um, of course, copies are available to borrow from Geelong Regional Libraries in hard copy and in ebook format. 
Unfortunately, due to stage three restrictions in regional Victoria, libraries will be closed from this Thursday, but you can still borrow, borrow copies in ebook format while the libraries are closed and hard copies will be available via a click and deliver service from August 12, which sounds pretty damn good to me. So finally, um, we've got Lynn Malaku wants to say thanks for a great night. Brooke Law, such a brilliant read. Thank you. Um, those are the last closing comments. Thank you again, Kate. Thank you, Geelong Regional Libraries and to you, the audience, for your time and attention tonight. Stay warm, stay well, wash your hands, wear a mask and keep reading. Good night. Thanks. Bye, everybody. <laughs>